So far we have uh, talked about uh, physics of uh, non-interacting systems where we studied the statistical mechanics of these systems uh, without any interparticle interaction and saw various properties and uh, uh, essentially you know computed those uh, thermodynamic parameters that uh, uh, gives you uh, rather the, the statistical mechanics gives this uh, internal structure of the system uh, which manifests in the form of these thermodynamic quantities. Um, uh, in the remaining part of the course, uh, what we plan to do is that uh, we plan to take on the interacting systems. As such, uh, there should be no uh, difference in treatment that is we can still uh, you know go ahead with the partition function and from there free energy and various things that uh, we have calculated so far. Uh, but the problem is that for an arbitrary two particle potential uh, made by Coulomb or something else, it is often uh, very difficult to find a closed form of the partition function and hence uh, we need to um, study uh, different techniques uh, for the interacting systems. Okay? So, for the first time we are talking about um, interacting systems that is uh, there are interparticle interactions which have to be taken into account uh, in a controlled manner even if we make some approximations the approximations should be justified that uh, these uh, really uh, will not give any erroneous result. So, that is how uh, we have to deal with these interacting systems. So, a uh, brief overview of that is that we will uh, give uh, general ideas on the phase transition. Basically, we will uh, again start with the ideal gas or now not ideal, but the real gas where the interactions are present and uh, we will uh, talk about this uh, van der Waals equation of state and so on and then uh, talk about virial expansion uh, and talk about the critical uh, isotherms and how uh, these critical uh, temperatures or the critical isotherms they uh, what kind of knowledge do they impart and um, uh, quickly we will uh, switch over to other interacting systems uh, such as an Ising model which is definitely a, a pedagogical model but very intuitive nevertheless and uh, we will discuss different methods of solution and uh, uh, we will uh, actually resort to a few methods in order to solve this problem uh, of this Ising model. Uh, and uh, in particular, we will uh, try to do transfer matrix uh, in this class and uh, there is no uh, really uh, a relationship between the top part of the, uh, the plan that you see and the bottom part. Uh, the only connect is that uh, here uh, in both the cases we are talking about uh, interacting systems uh, in uh, gas, we are talking about interaction between the particles. Uh, and in, um, in this Ising model we will talk about interaction between spins, neighboring spins and uh, we shall talk about uh, really in one dimension and, and being in one dimension it, it becomes even more uh, sort of uh, you know a pedagogical model uh, which uh, is only uh, taught for the purpose of uh, understanding how, what interactions could do and whether you know uh, there is a, a phase transition a magnetic phase transition such as say from a, a paramagnet to a ferromagnet kind of phase transition that we can come across. So, these phase transitions and the role of interactions are the glue uh, I mean that that is the glue for these two uh, the top part and the bottom part. Okay, so, let us uh, start with this uh, general uh, you know uh, definition of phase transitions we have given this before once again writing it. We have said that the free energy Helmholtz free energy is continuous, but we can also talk about the Gibbs free energy to be more to be continuous which is more precise. Um, so, the first order says that uh, the Gibbs free energy is continuous, but the first derivative of the Gibbs free energy either with respect to temperature or with respect to pressure they are discontinuous and um, uh, the first one is called as uh, entropy uh, here as you see and uh, the second one is the volume. Uh, they uh, discontinuously change across a phase transition. Now, to give you a general you know overview that phase transitions are always interesting that may it be uh, the structural phase transition suppose something going from um, tetragonal to orthorhombic and so on or it goes from a paramagnet to a ferromagnet or it is going from uh, liquid to solid such as say, uh, say 
ice or water to uh, vapor and so on or superconductor to normal all these things are uh, by and large interesting and uh, we shall look uh, here that how to deal with such phase transitions what are the markers of phase transitions and uh, these phase transitions are more often than not they are accompanied by these interacting uh, in, that is the interaction between the particles. Of course, we also have seen um, phase transitions in uh, non interacting systems such as uh, ideal bosons which uh, gave rise to this Bose-Einstein condensation uh, which is like a phase transition I mean from a uh, gaseous phase uh, below a certain temperature it becomes a uh, condensed. Okay. But here we are more uh, interested in talking about the uh, role of interactions present. So, a, in that same spirit uh, the second order phase transition also can be defined in which uh, uh, the Gibbs free energy is continuous. And not only that, uh, the S and V which were discontinuous in the first order, they are now continuous and uh, the discontinuity comes in the second order of G. Okay, so, uh, one of them is called as a CP or the specific heat at constant pressure which is minus T del 2 G del T 2 at a constant P. Similarly, we have um, all these uh, compressibilities and so on and so forth and then various other quantities which can often be you know associated with some order parameter or they are experimentally uh, measured and uh, they show some discontinuity at T equal to T c. So, below T c there is some kind of a phase that exists and above T c there is uh, some other kind of phase that exists. So, a very important thing in this study is uh, the uh, you know the phase diagram which we just uh, come to. Uh, here uh, we give an example of a second order phase transition in superconductors uh, and uh, this is a type 1 superconductors which has one uh, you know uh, HC uh, and uh, so uh, inside the dome that is the one fourth of a circle that you see nearly that uh, that kind of a shape. Uh, there is a superconducting phase and uh, uh, there is a normal phase that uh, lies uh, above this uh, line and this is called as a phase boundary and uh, the whole thing is called as a, uh, so this is a phase boundary. So, across the boundary uh, if you either increase temperature uh, of, the, uh, of the system. Uh, then it goes from a superconductor to a normal state or a metallic state and uh, or a, if you actually increase the uh, at a given temperature if you increase the uh, magnetic field it will still go from a superconductor to a normal state. Okay. And here we show a phase diagram. So, this is very important to show a phase diagram in order for us to understand that what kind of phase it is going uh, from one to another and so on. And if you look at these uh, specific heat this diagram as a function of temperature then you see that um, below this T c it has some variation which is given by this line and at T equal to T c there is a sharp drop or there is a discontinuity and because the specific heat is actually a second derivative of this Gibbs free energy or even the Helmholtz free energy it is a second order phase transition. So, this kind of phase transition we are also familiar in the magnetism uh, context or uh, in the context of paramagnet to a ferromagnet transition and so on. Okay. So, we are uh, really uh, talking about a phase diagram and phase boundaries and so on and something that could be uh, quite familiar to you is the uh, this called as a triple point diagram or uh, this is actually uh, a point this uh, triple point as you see here. Uh, this triple point that is the point T 0 uh, gas, liquid and solid they coexist. Okay. And it often happens that you know at least two phases coexist which we can understand if you take a block of ice um, in a say a, a cup uh, after a while you will see that there are some uh, there will be some ice left and there will be some water left. So, there is a coexisting phase of uh, water and ice uh, or liquid and solid. Uh, but uh, in this phase diagram the there is a triple point of water you see that there is a point at which all three of them coexist 
and um, these lines are the phase boundaries uh, which uh, you know if you cross from here to here you get a solid to a liquid phase if you cross from here to here you get a solid to a, a gaseous phase and if you uh, uh, make a transition from uh, from this point from the gaseous phase to a liquid across that boundary you see the uh, there is a liquid phase there okay and uh, this t0 is called as the uh, triple point temperature and which uh, for water it is 0 0.0075 uh, degree centigrade and uh, the tc that you see where actually these uh, the gas and the liquid they undergo a second order phase transition at this critical point even though this evaporation curve this is called as the evaporation curve is actually a first order uh, but at this point it becomes a second order transition and so on and um, so all the phases are uh, you know shown uh, so this is called as sublimation curve or the the boundary and there is a melting boundary and then there is a, a evaporation boundary and so on so there are these tcs so tc has a value which is uh, 374.2 uh, degree centigrade and so on ok. So, here uh, we uh, want to you know uh, specialize now uh, to a case where um, there are interaction effects and which you cannot uh, neglect and the system actually undergoes a phase transition which we have not seen when we have talked about ideal Bohr systems or ideal Fermi systems and so on ok. Uh, this is all uh, very well known to you the ideal gas law is written as uh, PV equal to uh, NKT or PV equal to NRT where N the small n denotes the number of moles and uh, if you want to uh, actually uh, connect to the interacting system or include the effects of interaction uh, you would uh, sort of write the similar kind of equation but now no longer is a bare pressure of the gas or the bare volume it is a P effective multiplied by V effective which is equal to the NRT. So, it is the same equation that you see or the form of the equation is same however, P and P effective are not the same. So, the picture that emerges is that uh, we have to really talk about this finite size of the, the I mean the finiteness of the uh, atoms or the molecules in question and these atoms and molecules have a finite size. So, they cannot come to distance closer than this what is uh, shown here ok. So, which is equal to the uh, diameter of these atoms. So, they cannot come closer than the diameter uh, that is the radius and multiplied by 2 and this is uh, shown as R0. So, the kind of interaction that one is talking about here is a hardcore uh, repulsive interaction as R tends to R0. So, as R tends to R0 uh, they touch each other and they cannot go any farther that is they cannot penetrate one into another. So, you get an infinitely large potential which is repulsive which means it is positive and as you make them go slightly away uh, from each other then the uh, magnitude of the potential comes down and at some value it becomes you know negative and then it starts rising. Uh, and uh, becomes weakly negative at large values of R and this has an attractive tail uh, which is uh, similar to the dipole dipole interaction that we have ok. So, dipole potential and so on. So, the main feature of this is that they are weakly attractive at large distances and they are strongly repulsive at short distances ok. So, this is the main uh, thing that one can easily understand that uh, why they are like that uh, in a gas and in which case uh, one can actually find out that the uh, P effective is nothing but the P the bare P uh, which uh, you do not take into account the size of these atoms and this hard core nature it is simply P plus A prime n square by V square uh, and uh, the V effective is like V minus B prime n uh, where B prime is just half of these uh, you know uh, the radius or rather this uh, the volume of these spheres uh, of radius uh, 2 r 0 and this is like uh, 16 pi r 0 uh, cube by 3 which is this b prime and uh, one actually uh, gets there are expressions of a prime as well. So, one can get these um, expressions um, uh, this expression which is called as a van der Waals equation of state uh, which tells you that it is uh, p plus a into n over v uh, whole square 
into V minus B n equal to n R T. Um, it is uh, important to see that this is actually written for n moles if you make n equal to 1 then it is p plus a by v square and uh, v minus b equal to r t. But uh, uh, let us keep that uh, the mole uh, the n to be the number of moles and this is called as a, a van der Waals equation of state and this uh, all of you are aware of that uh, this differs from the ideal equation of state that in ideal equation of state we have simply a PV equal to RT or NRT. Here we have these P modified and V modified. So, this in our uh, language that we have written in the last slide is P effective and this is like a V effective. Okay. So, we keep the same form of the ideal gas law, but uh, now these P's are changed to P effective and V's are changed to V effective. All right. So, uh, what do we do with that or how uh, do we study you know uh, phase transitions etcetera. So, what we do is that we can uh, do a virial expansion and uh, so let us do the virial expansion. Uh, so, what we do is uh, we uh, start by rescaling the uh, van der Waals equation and what I mean by rescaling is that we write a n square equal to some other constant a. So, we scale these um, uh, the a factor which is like the correction factor if a equal to 0 b equal to 0 you get back uh, the ideal gas law. So, this is um, the scaling that we do. So, b equal to b n and uh, r uh, say for example, r uh, bar is equal to n r. Okay. So, this rescaling if you do it uh, on the this van der Waals equation of state. Uh, then what we get is that so your p becomes equal to uh, r bar t divided by uh, v minus b uh, minus a by v square. Okay, so uh, this gives you uh, pv equal to rt pv over rt is equal to um, so this is uh, it used to be one earlier but now we get all these uh, extra terms because of the interactions being involved. So, it is A divided by R, uh, T and V. Okay. So, that is the uh, equation that we have to deal with and uh, what we do is that uh, we uh, do a virial expansion which means that we do a Taylor expansion of these uh, of this term. Okay. And uh, what is that? So, this is equal to 1 by minus B by V. Uh, to the power minus 1 and it is 1 plus uh, b by v plus a b by v whole square and so on. Okay. So, you have terms uh, it depends at how many terms you want to keep then uh, we can write down this put this into this equation let us call this equation as equation 1 and this as equation 2. So, uh, if you put 2 in 1. Um, we get a P V over R T this is equal to 1 plus 1 over V uh, B minus A over R T and so on. And uh, then we have the correction terms which are like uh, I mean the extra terms basically by V cube and so on so forth. Okay. So, uh, this uh, really has uh, the form of a virial expansion and uh, so your uh, this is like 1 plus c 2 over v plus a c 3 over v square and so on. Okay. Where uh, of course, we know the form of c 2 c 2 is equal to b minus a over r t. Okay. So, uh, c n is called as the nth virial coefficient. Okay. So, that is the called as this nth virial um, coefficient and um, so the main question now is that how uh, or rather quantitatively how much uh, does this uh, van der Waals equation uh, for a real gas differ from that uh, from the ideal gas law which is P V equal to N R T. 
and um, uh, this uh, will give uh, see these uh, various uh, uh, coefficients that you see here the uh, nth virial coefficient or the second virial coefficient is the leading order correction to the ideal gas law. C3 is the second leading order correction to the ideal gas law and so on. So, if you can find all these, uh, uh, these coefficients, virial coefficients, then of course, you uh, know how much sort of real gas differs from an ideal gas. Okay? And uh, so, let us look at uh, these uh, critical uh, points and uh, we will look at this critical isotherms, but let us just uh, work out this uh, uh, equation that you see here. Uh, these equation that you see here which is called as a van der Waals equation of state. Uh, what are the solutions of this van der Waals equation of state and uh, whether they have any criticality which means that uh, if there is uh, uh, we can find out the solutions of these uh, for this equation then the solutions means that for those values of the parameters uh, the equation is satisfied or the uh, the right hand side of the equation is 0 which means that uh, we are talking about of course uh, p plus a by v square uh, into v minus b minus nrt equal to 0 okay so these uh, will have to be solved and then uh, that's what we try so we write down this equation recast this equation or the van der waals equation as um, uh, p v square plus a n square uh, this is just another way of writing it and a v minus b and this is equal to sorry n b n b and this is equal to um, uh, n r uh, t v square okay now you see uh, it's a cubic equation in v Uh, which means that uh, there are uh, three solutions that should exist. And it is not necessarily that all the solutions would be real solutions, there could be complex solutions as well. So, it is anyway, it is a third degree polynomial in V and uh, it is not difficult to see that for T less than T c where T c is marked here. So, uh, your T c is corresponding to this P c and V c uh, corresponding to this uh, sort of point c in the isotherm which is for different uh, you know uh, constant temperature. So, T less than T c uh, is what we are uh, looking at. So, T less than T c and P less than P c uh, we have uh, uh, this equation has three uh, different real roots. Okay. So, that is 1 uh, at t equal to t c. So, this is the critical point itself there is just one um, uh, three fold degenerate real root. Okay. So, uh, there are still three roots, but all of them are same. Okay, at t equal to tc and at uh, t greater than tc. Uh, so, we have one uh, real root and um, okay, and two uh, sort of imaginary roots. All right. So, uh, we can uh, write this down notationally as a v minus v c whole cube equal to 0. Okay? And uh, this if you expand it, it becomes equal to v cube minus 3 v c uh, v square uh, plus 3 v c square v minus v uh, c cube, this is equal to 0. So, let me go back and show you the picture. Now, you see that there are two isotherms shown for temperature greater than T c. So, they have uh, they do not uh, you know uh, have any critical uh, temperature or rather these are not critical isotherms and the critical isotherms occurs at T equal to T c where you see that it, it just touches this C point corresponding to a critical volume and below that uh, these two temperatures that you see below. Uh, they have uh, these uh, sort of you know points where the solution exists. So, 
So, this point let me uh, draw it with a color. And those are the three different uh, real roots that you have. And uh, there is one real root uh, for uh, t greater than t c which you see here. Let me draw again with a different color. So, this is that uh, uh, sort of temperature uh, where you have just one real root of the um, this uh, van der Waals equation of state. Okay. So, um, so this of course, uh, forgot to write this, but then uh, this means that t equal to t c p equal to p c t greater than t c p uh, greater than p c and uh, it is easy to see from the equation of state that these are the conditions where you have these solutions. So, if you um, if you take this expansion uh, which you see here and if you take this uh, term that we have written here, yeah this equation. So, let me call this as equation 2 and uh, this equation as equation 3. So, if you compare equation 2 and equation 3, one gets um, a 3 V c is equal to N B plus uh, N R T c over P c that is 3 V c which is here this term and then we have uh, 3 V c square that is the second term we have this equal to uh, A N square divided by P c and then we also have a V c cube which is a last term which is equal to A B N cube by P c. Okay. And then uh, of course, uh, we have V c equal to 3 B n um, and uh, P c is equal to uh, A divided by 27 B square and uh, uh, R T c this is equal to 8 a by 27 b. Okay. So, these are the uh, solutions that you get by comparing the equation that you just uh, uh, notionally write as v minus v c whole cube, expand that and then compare term by term with uh, the van der Waals equation of state. Okay. So, if you want to uh, compare with the ideal gas, so uh, comparison with the ideal gas, let us see it here. And um, what we uh, do is that we get a Z C define a quantity as Z C uh, which is equal to P C V C by N R T C. This is equal to if you put in all the values that we have obtained you get a 3 by 8 which is 0 3 7 5. So, Z C uh, quantifies how a gas deviates from the uh, from the ideal gas behavior. So, if it is an ideal gas then of course, Z c equal to 1 because we know that P v equal to N R T at this critical um, temperature pressure and volume it will become P c V c equal to N R T c equal to 1 but it is not 1, but here it is uh, uh, this uh, 0.375 and um, so we have uh, for water um, this is even worse because uh, you have a Z C to be even lower which means that it deviates uh, from the ideal gas law. Uh, so, Z C equal to 0.226 as opposed to 0.375 for a for a gas and uh, this uh, T c comes out to be equal to 324 degree centigrade. Okay. So, in fact, the deviation from the real gas law or from the ideal gas law is more and this is actually uh, it underestimates this uh, virial expansion underestimates the, uh, the deviation. So, which means the deviation is actually more. Okay. So, uh, we just gave a, a very brief introduction to uh, phase transitions and uh, we have uh, tried to bring in the 
a fact that these uh, particles are interacting and we have to deviate from uh, the uh, ideal gas law and then we have shown that these uh, things are or rather these uh, virial expansion gives you uh, how much we differ or how much we digress from the ideal gas law uh, by putting in some numbers and uh, we have shown it for uh, a classical ideal gas or a classical gas and water and which are these values like how much they differ or the ZC which quantifies the digression from the ideal gas law is 0.375 and 0.226 and so on. So, had it been an ideal gas then we would have got Z equal to 1. So, I uh, change gear and uh, talk about um, this uh, phase transitions in magnetic systems. And the only link that we have with the previous discussion is that both are interacting systems. And um, if you remember, we have actually dealt with uh, magnetic systems, but never uh, included the role of interactions there. We simply said that a bunch of magnetic moments are placed in an external field, or we have said that uh, there are quantum mechanical spins, non interacting, they are put in a magnetic field where the Hamiltonian is given by some. Uh, say minus s dot b or something uh, that is like a Zeeman term where s can take values from minus s to plus s or even for a spin half system we it can take value from minus half to plus half or uh, something similar to that. Okay. Uh, so, uh, now whether uh, you know this uh, kind of systems uh, can show phase transitions or what is a minimal model. Uh, Hamiltonian that would demonstrate a phase transition that is what we want to address now. Okay. So, that is the plan and um, as I said earlier that uh, there could be no difference between the way we have dealt with non interacting systems, but the only problem that is posed by the form of the interaction which may not allow you to decouple the partition function into single particle partition functions. For example, if you remember that we have written z equal to z 1 to the power n and uh, because it is simply like factored out like a z 1 into z 1 into z 1 and so on. Uh, so, you had to just calculate the one particle partition function and take the you know the, the k t log z of that or z 1 of that and then uh, evaluate various things. And if you really want any information about n particles then you just raise it to the power n I mean the, the partition function can be raised to the power n or the log of that can have a n as a, a pre factor which is which denotes the number of particles all right. But however, such a decoupling scheme may not work for an interacting system especially when there are pairwise interactions. Okay. And uh, we uh, really need to learn different techniques that are available and we will not talk about all the techniques because that will uh, be uh, overdoing this uh, Ising model, but we will at least tell you uh, one or two techniques or maybe uh, one more than that maybe three techniques and so on. And then we will explain that how that gives rise to a scenario where we understand that there is a phase transition from a paramagnetic phase to a ferromagnetic phase. Okay. So, um, now this uh, magnetic ordering if you have read solid state physics or if you have read the magnetism chapter you know that uh, uh, your paramagnet or diamagnet can be explained by uh, without invoking any uh, electron electron interaction or spin spin interaction. So, a non interacting picture can uh, capture the uh, paramagnetic behavior or the diamagnetic behavior. However, if you have a ferromagnetism in the system it is not uh, you have to necessarily include uh, the uh, interparticle interactions or the electronic interactions. So, uh, even uh, we say that this has exchange interaction and write it as uh, some S i dot S j in the Heisenberg sense, but uh, uh, these interaction effects are solely caused by the Coulomb repulsion between the electrons. Okay. So, this even if you think of a super exchange interaction 
for an exchange interaction they are uh, solely because of the electrons being present there and which are um, interacting via coulomb term so um, so this is the uh, sort of uh, thing that we should uh, you know then uh, to study magnetism we should uh, definitely invoke uh, interaction or at least the spin spin interaction and here we do exactly that we would write down a spin only model and that too in one dimension and this is called as the Ising model. It is one of the most uh, widely studied uh, paradigmatic model uh, showing you know phase transitions from paramagnet to ferromagnet and um, there are in, uh, in 2D there is an exact solution by Onsager and in 1D of course you can solve it by a variety of methods uh, and I will show you the some of the methods or at least mention uh, most of the methods that are used. And this is a, a model where uh, what you have is that you have a chain and you have these uh, say these sites which we label as i, i plus 1, i plus 2 etc and uh, there is a spin there and uh, this spin is actually a spin half ok. So, uh, we write down the Hamiltonian as minus j uh, s i s i plus 1 i goes from 1 to n. So, a spin here would interact with a spin here with an exchange interaction or with a sort of strength which is j. Uh, and this is only a nearest neighbor interaction. So, one uh, a, a spin will not interact with something here or uh, one here will not interact with something very far away. So, the interaction is purely nearest neighbor, uh, we are talking about one dimension and uh, even we can you know have more simplification in which we use a periodic boundary condition, we call it as PBC in which the first uh, spin is connected to the nth spin and this uh, way we can uh, uh, avoid or rather eliminate edge effects or the finite size effects. So, when you have finite size uh, like if you are talking about say uh, 100 such sites or 10,000 such sites, if the results differ uh, then you cannot be sure that whether you are capturing the uh, thermodynamic limit properly. So, you have to you know go to higher and higher uh, chains or rather number of sites in a chain in order to get a more uh, reliable result. But if you do a periodically you know uh, or rather if you uh, connect the first to the end by the same interaction j and uh, then of course, we can uh, eliminate that edge effect. And this j is called as exchange interaction or uh, this is a scalar model uh, where S i takes values plus or minus 1 each of the S i's that are there in the site uh, corresponding to the z component of the spin half object that you see. And uh, these each of these spin half, uh, half objects they interact with each other by a strength j and we are taking j to be positive here ok. And uh, for this discussion we are taking this j to be positive. Now, in 1D uh, this model would not show any phase transition and why is that? The reason is that uh, if you have suppose this uh, let us talk about 6 spins. So, we have a j here, we have a j here, we have a j, j, j. So, the energy of this fully ordered state it is a ferromagnetic state is equal to let us call it as E uh, f this is equal to minus 5 j right because there are 5 bonds there and we have not uh, done any double counting ok. Now, you consider another state which is fully disordered because this is 0 magnetic moment the net magnetic moment is 0, but then you see that you have only broken one bond as compared to the this one uh, the one that is on the top. So, ok corresponding to say for example, this is A and this is B. So, it is only one bond broken in B. So, uh, this for the paramagnet the energy is equal to uh, minus 4 j ok. So, uh, the 
delta of E divided by say for example, E f is nothing but equal to 1 over 5. Okay? Uh, just talking about the magnitude of that. So, this is like 1 over 5. So, for n spins or n sites, this thing will go as 1 over n. This uh, change in uh, the relative change in energy between a fully disordered state and a fully ordered state. Okay. So, now you see that as n tends to infinity, this uh, difference between a fully disordered state and a fully ordered state goes to 0 which means that the system can never order at any finite temperature okay? uh, with a very uh, sort of infinitesimal, very small infinitesimal temperature the system would make a transition from uh, ferromagnet to a paramagnet and there will be no ordering that can happen. Okay? So, in this model what one does is that uh, one actually includes um, magnetic field an external magnetic field and one can write down the uh, Hamiltonian as minus H SI uh, I from 1 to N and minus J uh, SI uh, SI plus 1 uh, where I goes from 1 to N and remember these SIs are scalar variables they can take values equal to plus minus 1 and H is actually the external magnetic field. And uh, if you have any um, requirement of uh, magnetic moment, etc., or Bohr magneton, you can uh, this can actually absorb that, which means this small h is equal to some uh, mu zero capital H, where capital H actually denotes the magnetic field. But uh, nevertheless, we'll use this small h as the magnetic field, and uh, or rather treat it as an external magnetic field without that uh, worrying about that mu zero factor or this magnetic moment etc. And this is the um, Hamiltonian for an Ising model in one dimension which one needs to solve and one needs to see that uh, if there is any transition that can uh, that is possible at any finite temperature. Okay? So, what is the critical temperature below is the, st uh, the system orders uh, into a ferromagnet and uh, above which temperature this actually the ferromagnetism is completely destroyed and you get a paramagnetic state. Okay. So, uh, there are uh, various methods of solution as I told I mean they are uh, like a perturbative solution a variational solution. Uh, mean field solution. In fact, this mean field solutions are uh, quite important in more than one dimension and then uh, we can have um, you know exact solution and um, this exact solution like one of them I will uh, discuss which is called as a transfer matrix. Okay, and f this is uh, a renormalization group. So, I will also show the renormalization group and there are uh, fully numerical methods such as uh, Monte Carlo simulations etcetera which also captures this phase transition in this model. So, just to summarize what have I said is the following that uh, let us try to solve a minimal model or rather even before we solve let us write down a minimal model which takes into account a spin spin interaction. Uh, if we are lucky enough we will be able to write down the partition function in terms of or rather we will be able to decouple it and solve uh, for that and then get various uh, physical quantities. If we are not then we have to resort to some numerical solutions etcetera and uh, there are other you know analytic solutions that exist like for example, in this perturbative solutions you can take this uh, the second term as the perturbation and the first term uh, as the parent term which is H0. So, H equal to H0 plus H1 and then you can calculate the correction uh, at a given order 
uh, to the ground state energy and also you can calculate the ground state wave function and so on. And from there, suppose you are, uh, uh, you are able to uh, calculate the uh, the partition function in a closed form and then you know what to do you calculate f and then you calculate m which is del f del h and magnetization will tell you that whether the uh, there is a paramagnetic state which corresponds to m equal to 0 and uh, m to be finite for uh, for this um, for the ferromagnetic phase ok. So, um, let us do one at least uh, for now and then we will continue with other methods later. So, what is a transfer matrix method? So, let me write down the Hamiltonian once again. So, the Hamiltonian is minus h sum over i s i you know the sum is over 1 to n and minus j uh, s i s i plus 1. Um, Oh, see over this uh, large period of time that this model was proposed and then um, the extensive you know analysis uh, study of this model investigation and vi different variants of this model have been uh, talked about. As I said that this model uh, is uh, it can be solved in 1D, but cannot be solved exactly in 1D by uh, the known methods and this Onsagar provides a solution known methods means of course, that is also a known method, but the methods that we have discussed so far. Uh, here we are uh, you know going by a conventional method uh, which gives you um, the solution. Uh, as I said that uh, there is no uh, solution uh, of the, or the, there is no TC uh, which, uh, which gives rise to uh, or rather which demarcates the uh, the, the paramagnetic phase from the ferromagnetic phase that is T less than T c we have a ferromagnet and T greater than T c we have a, a paramagnet in the bare model that is without this H term. However, uh, in 2 D Ising model uh, these uh, number of neighbors are not just one uh, right we saw that one bond is broken between a typical disordered state and a typical ordered state ok. Uh, this change in energy in two dimension is of the order of root n not 1 of the order of 1. So, root n for n to be large uh, this change in energy separating the disordered state and the ordered state could be very large which stabilizes and Onsager actually found that uh, the result for this gives you about um, uh, I think around 2.26 uh, j over k that is the transition temperature. T c equal to um, if I am not wrong uh, exact number uh, let me check then um, yeah. So, uh, this is uh, 2.269 uh, j over k in 2 d and uh, there is no analytic solution in 3 d, but this actually becomes equal to 4 uh, j over k uh, in 3 d ok. Uh, and in 1D this uh, T c is equal to 0, uh, but of course, we are now uh, including this magnetic field that is there. And um, so, uh, we are uh, going to solve it by a method called as a transfer matrix method and the transfer matrix method involves writing down the partition function. So, the partition function that we can write down here is z. Uh, now, I will sort of open it and use periodic boundary condition. Uh, so, I will write in P B C. So, z is equal to this sum over s. Now, s as I said can take values plus 1 or minus 1 and it is exponential beta j uh, you know s 1 s 2 plus s 2 s 3 uh, plus s uh, n s 1 that is what I said that they are the last and the first are connected by a j and uh, then we also have uh, exponential. So, it is exponential minus beta h that is what I am writing. So, exponential beta h uh, s 1 plus s 2 and so on and then all the way till s n ok. So, that is the um, thing that you have to or rather that is the expression that you have to compute 
uh, for all of S's that is S1, S2, S3 to have values plus 1 and minus 1. Okay? And uh, one can actually use a trick because uh, you see these things uh, twice inside the product. So, S1 comes twice because S1 is in the first term and in the last term. S2 is in the first term and the second term. S3 is in the second term and the third term and so on. So, Sn is in the, uh, the, the last but one term and in the last term. So, we can write this down as um, uh, exponential beta j S1 S2 plus beta h uh, S1 plus S2 by 2 um, and uh, exponential beta j S2 S3 um, plus these are all inside the exponential. Okay, So, uh, please uh, make sure that you have nice brackets everywhere so that uh, there is no confusion. So, it is S2 S3 and plus um, beta h uh, S2 plus S3 divided by 2 um, and so on. Okay. So, what we did is that we have taken this uh, because each term uh, e appears twice here as well as appears you know uh, once here. So, we take half the contribution that is S1 plus S2 by 2, then we have taken S2 plus S3 by 2. So, that uh, you know uh, these S2 uh, becomes uh, you know taken twice. Uh, divided by half. So, that compensates for these uh, or rather that takes into account the second term okay? and the first term is nicely taken into account each term appears twice and then you have terms here which involve S3, S4 etcetera and the last term would look like exponential beta j uh, Sn S1 okay? uh, plus a beta h uh, Sn plus S1 by 2. Okay. So, these that is the close form of this. If you can solve this, uh, you would get the partition function and then getting all other quantities is not a problem. All right. So, uh, this we write as a transfer matrix S1, S2. This we write as a transfer matrix S2, S3 and this we write as transfer matrix Sn, S1 and so on. Okay. Now, all these are identical because each of the S's SI that you see have to be summed over the values plus 1 and minus 1. So, that is easy to do uh, we can uh, like write down this S i uh, S j that is uh, any of the i and j uh, to have uh, you know elements which can be written down in the basis that you have. Uh, so, we uh, write this matrix and we write it in a basis in which uh, my uh, S i equal to 1, S i equal to minus 1 and I have a S i plus 1 equal to 1 and S i plus 1 equal to minus 1. So, the neighboring spins like S 1, S 2, uh, S 2, S 3 etcetera. Uh, this uh, when they are both equal to 1, then what happens is that you have a 1 into 1 which is 1 and 1 plus 1 by 2 is just 1. So, it is exponential beta j plus beta h. So, we can write this as exponential beta j plus h for this 1 1 term. And similarly, for the minus 1 minus 1, you see that this will be minus 1 into minus 1, which again becomes exponential beta j. But then this minus 1 minus 1 by 2 it becomes exponential minus beta h. So, this can be written as exponential beta j minus h. But what happens is that if one of them is plus 1 and the other is minus 1, then the beta h term vanishes. Okay, because 1 of them is plus 1 and minus 1 they become 0, but and you have a exponential minus beta j factor in the off diagonal terms. So, this is exponential minus beta j exponential minus beta j. So, once uh, you have these matrices now you see your partition function is simply T 1 to 
T23, T34 and so on and then Tn1. Okay. So, we still have these uh, n 2 by 2 matrices, so they have to be multiplied, but then uh, multiplying uh, 2 by 2 matrices still gives rise to a 2 by 2 matrix and that is not uh, difficult to find. Uh, what one can do is that one can actually uh, do this that is find out the trace uh, or uh, this is T n to the power S 1 S 1. Now, you see it is here I mean S 1 um, well I mean this is actually S 1 S 2 if you write it in that. Uh, so, here T uh, i j equal to T S i S j I am just using a shorthand notation here. So, instead of writing S 1 S 2 I just write uh, T 1 2. So, I can write this as uh, uh, this S and then it is a T to the power n 1 1. Okay. So, uh, what it means is that when you multiply you see that you will have these, uh, uh, these uh, multiplication of this n 2 by 2 matrices and uh, we the solution for that is that a trace of uh, t to the power n uh, where uh, t is each of these matrices that we write here. So, we have to take these uh, uh, take a matrix raise it to the power n and then take the trace of that. Now, this raising it to the power n is not uh, difficult because uh, this when you have a trace here this really means the sum of the eigenvalues of this T matrix. So, lambda i uh, belongs to or rather uh, denotes the eigenvalue of the T matrix. Okay. So, of the T i matrix of a particular matrix. So, you see the partition function just reduces to finding the eigenvalue of each of those matrices uh, or just one matrix and then raise it to the power n. There are two eigenvalues of course, because it is a 2 by 2 matrix. So, we have to just deal with that sum. Okay. Now, what happens is that uh, this we can simply write it as z is equal to uh, lambda 1 to the power n plus a lambda 2 to the power n okay? because there are two uh, uh, lambdas and uh, you can easily solve for this lambda by solving this 2 by 2 matrix that you see here. So, these uh, the matrix that you see here has eigenvalues lambda 1 and lambda 2 and the lambda 1 and 2 are uh, written as exponential uh, beta j. Uh, cosine hyperbolic uh, beta j and a plus minus uh, exponential 2 beta j plus sine hyperbolic square beta h plus exponential minus 2 beta j and uh, that is it to the power half. So, um, uh, lambda 1 corresponds to the positive sign that you see between the two terms and lambda 2 corresponds to the negative sign that you see uh, between the two terms. Uh, now, what happens is that uh, uh, one of them is larger, so, lambda 1 is larger because there is sum of two positive definite quantities. Now, when you raise it to the power n in order to calculate the partition function, uh, lambda 2 will start diminishing as n increases. So, what I mean is that your lambda uh, 1 is greater than lambda 2. So, lambda 1 to the power n is much much greater than lambda 2 to the power n. So, hence neglect one of the eigenvalues that is a smaller eigenvalue completely from the partition function. Okay. So, we can uh, write this z is equal to lambda 1 to the power n uh, and I hope it is clear to you that why I neglected uh, this uh, the other term that is because um, uh, with increasing these uh, with increasing n um, the uh, the lambda 2 which is which comes with a negative sign becomes smaller and smaller. So, if you have a large uh, n that is number of sides being large you have uh, these one of the eigenvalues will dominate, 
the other eigenvalue will go to 0. And now uh, it's straightforward, we calculate the magnetization in order to uh, do this uh, rather to see the you know the phase information whether this phase has uh, a, a sort of a magnetization finite magnetization. Uh, important question is that whether there is a magnetization without a magnetic field which is called as spontaneous magnetization. Now that uh, we have argued that this cannot be there in 1D um, Ising model, but let us at least uh, do this uh, calculation in order to convince ourselves. So, it is a uh, minus del F del H, uh, F is nothing but uh, minus K T log Z and uh, you can just take a log of that which the N comes in front and then you have to take a log of lambda 1, you know already lambda 1 and then uh, it is simple to do it. So, this is equal to minus del del H of k t log z and uh, this is equal to uh, 1 over beta lambda 1 del lambda 1 del H and if you do this simplification it becomes equal to sin hyperbolic beta H. Uh, divided by uh, root over of sin hyperbolic square beta h uh, plus e to the power minus 4 beta j. Okay. So, that is the magnetization. Now, you see that the magnetization is 0 if you put h equal to 0. So, So, no spontaneous magnetization. So, it cannot order and we have given that energetic argument to show that this model in 1D can really not uh, order if you do not put a magnetic field. With the magnetic field of course, it will order if the strength of the magnetic field is large or rather uh, if it uh, the magnetic energy associated with the magnetic field is larger than uh, the thermal energy then of course, it will order. So, but this part as we have uh, you know argued is true uh, and suppose uh, you have the other limit that is uh, uh, H not equal to 0 and, and low temperature that is beta large. Okay. Um, then we have the sin hyperbolic square beta h much much greater than exponential minus 4 beta j 4, 4 beta uh, j yes 4 beta j and uh, this gives you m equal to 1 okay and uh, so this also uh, agrees with our uh, earlier you know uh, understanding of the spin system non interacting spin system so if you have a magnetic field uh, and you have uh, you know uh, this uh, pairwise interaction between the spins, the neighboring spins and you have uh, the magnetic field not equal to 0 and you are still at low temperature, then there is a, a phase transition that exists. So, there is a phase transition um, from uh, paramagnet to a ferromagnet under this condition where h is not equal to 0 and then uh, you have uh, the temperature to be low. Okay. So, uh, let us stop here and um, uh, in the next class we will uh, show some more techniques of solving this Hamiltonian or this model. Um, and uh, we will see what the results uh, kind of emerge and uh, uh, but uh, nevertheless uh, what we have uh, decided or rather what we have understood so far is correct that uh, this model would not give you any ordering uh, at any finite temperature uh, without any magnetic field okay? and we will do a method called as a renormalization group uh, in the next class. Thank you. Thank you.